I have unfortunately several friends who um, have cancer of various types and I worry. Nemesis. Oh, I'm picturing like some evil <laughs> doctor. Um, nemesis, nemesis, nemesis. It's just frustrating to see the lobbyists that, you know, they're paid to insist that their products are safe, but so were the tobacco lobbyists. And yeah, everybody raises big tobacco is why we shouldn't believe industry. And I'm not even asking you to believe industry, but you have very good regulators in the European Commission in Europe, the FDA in the United States, certainly in Health Canada, who share information, who work with scientific bodies, who receive this, who do their assessments, and they're the ones who have the final authority on determining if products are safe or not. My name is Holly Rasky, and I am a, a lawyer and government relations professional in the energy sector. So this is my house. Why don't you guys come on in and see what's in my bathroom cabinet? Unfortunately, several friends who um, have cancer of various types, and I worry, you know, how, how, why do they have that? Why do people get diseases? Is there anything that we can do to to uh, make the odds better? And or being organic and trying to choose organic products when I can seems like a good idea to try and minimize those risks. I don't think I know a lot about organic products. I try to be careful about what I buy. Uh, if I have a choice between organic and non-organic, I tend to choose organic, but I don't necessarily um, have a rationale for doing that, except that I think it's good for me. You know that there are things that are going to kill you out there or that are bad for you if these products are, are available on the shelves, especially in pharmacies. You do it anyway and you assume that whatever the risk is, it, it's probably minimal. I'd like the government to make my life um, healthier and better by providing me with information so I can make choices for myself. It's complicated and there's a lot of products out there to monitor and a lot of things that we don't know. I'm also a little concerned about getting gouged on some of this. It seems that as soon as you slap the label organic on a product, the price doubles. Uh, well, we've just walked into the Green Living Show. There's a lot of exhibits to see, so a lot of um, opportunities to maybe find ways that I can improve my life. Ooh, bamboo life. I wouldn't like Free stuff. Okay. Adam? Yeah, okay. See the other way. So, as you know, Adria is a best selling author of Ecoholic, Ecoholic Home, and Ecoholic Body. Thank you very much. I think it's my earliest ecoholic epiphany. My hairspray can could cause a hole in the ozone there. And I remember thinking, how is it that this is even allowed to happen? And you know what? Canadians coast to coast, we're all doing the exact same thing in our bathrooms, in the store, picking up products going, what is all this stuff? Do we need it? And is it actually safe? And we could play a little bit of a game I call what's in this stuff anyway. So I'm gonna need three volunteers, one at a time. All right. Hello. Hello. Can you tell everyone what your name is, please? Hi, I'm Holly. This is Holly. Now, let me bring you over here. I actually- To our next category product. I actually use some of this. You actually use some of this? Okay, so we're gonna walk, we're gonna walk through these. We have five products here in front of you. Any guesses at which of these four products share a toxin in common? Uh, which of the four? And not the toothpaste? You're going to leave the toothpaste out? Not the toothpaste. Um, I'm going to say not that one. Oh, okay. Not this one? Yeah. I'm going to actually get a big buzzer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the four that share toxic comment are actually these four. The Colgate Total, the Dial Complete, oh. the Silver Chain, and the <laughs> Aluminum Free Deodorant. It's great. Do you want to take a guess at what the toxin might be that they share in common? Uh, would it be that one that started with the letter M? No. The one with the letter M. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is not it, but no. it is close. Anyone? 
Trick the set, exactly. More invisible money your way. And so it messes with our endocrine system, it, which means it messes with the hormones in our bodies, which tell our, our bodies how to grow from, let's say, childhood to adulthood. So, I will tell you. And I put this one in my mouth. And this one's in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it is actually the only toothpaste that contains tricocin. So that, that was some great information, and I'm wondering, where should I start? It sounds like there's so many areas that I should be worried about with my soap, my shampoo, my toothbrush, my toothpaste. Where do I begin? Well, since on stage we were talking about your toothpaste having triple sand in it, I would say, boom, that's the number one you should switch right there. If there's triple sand in any of your products, whether it's hand soap, toothpaste, get rid of it today. So maybe people just need to be more aware about what to look for when they're reading labels. Yeah, unfortunately, until the government takes a little more control of the situation, then we've got to be our own label cops. This, I'm very sad about this. I have been using this toothpaste for years, and um, specifically because my dentist suggested it, because it's supposed to be really good for cleaning plaque, all that stuff. And this was one of the products that we were talking about yesterday that um, apparently has chemical in it that is so bad that they don't sell this in the United States with that ingredient in it, but they allow it to be sold in Canada. Uh, I don't even know where you find ingredients on toothpaste. Oh, I see a 1-800 number I could call. And a lot of things it does, like prevent tartar, but... Um, isn't that interesting? Unless it's one of these white on white. Adrian Vassell didn't, um, did not convince me that I should be changing all of my habits. I mean, it makes me wonder what her, what the claim exactly is, where she got her information. Is her information accurate? Yeah, you got to be really good if you could show me how all these things are going to kill me. I would love to. Yeah, and all kinds of trouble. I learned a lot from your lecture at the Green Living Show and I was looking in my medicine cabinet at home and discovered that a lot of the products that I have had a lot of long words. I think some of them were mentioned by you as being really bad. Okay. And I'm hoping that maybe you can help me pick out a few products that I think I'd like to replace as, as my first wave of, of dealing with things. I would love to. Um, you did specifically mention an ingredient in, in this product, which I use. Oh, and I couldn't find ingredients on the tube, but... It, it is in the box. They're on the box, yep. which, of course, you don't keep, so I find that strange. Um, but anyway, it, can you remind me, it was a product that started with the letter T. T-R-I-C-L-O-S-A-N, triclosan. Okay, and what exactly is that and why is it bad? Now, the triclosan in there is actually now a major environmental contaminant, and Environment Canada and Health Canada have been looking at it the last mm. few years. They classified it as a quote-unquote danger to the environment, and it's causing problems for things like frogs. We're seeing thyroid disruption in frogs. Okay, well, too bad for the frogs. What about me? What about you? <laughs> I would say this particular ingredient, Health Canada would say, is still safe. So my name is Elizabeth Dunn. I'm a consumer product safety inspector at Health Canada. Particular ingredient Health Canada would say is still safe. But not um, good for frogs. It's now at this point a suspected endocrine disruptor. We see it uh, messing with high hormone function in, uh, in animals, but not yet in humans. I would say right now that it's better to get rid of it and be good to the planet as well as yourself okay. and just oust it today. So Health Canada is monitoring uh, the use of triclosan. Health Canada does not have an issue with it at this time, but like all ingredients, um, Health Canada is monitoring the scientific information um, as it comes to light. Um, yeah. It's frustrating because Health Canada has said, you know, that we are going to declare this ingredient toxic, and when we do, it's going to we're going to voluntarily ask companies to start phasing it out because it is harmful to the environment. So. Mm. Um, it's unfortunate that companies are still insisting on using it. I'm really interested in these brands like the Herbal Essence. That sounds, does that, is that really herbal and good for you? <laughs> these guys are the kings of greenwash. They actually... Greenwash? Oh yeah. Look at the big green. Oh, I know. And you know, their shampoos used to have a woman talking about how it was a truly organic experience. Yeah. But they didn't actually mean organic in a sense of, you know, grown without pesticides. They just meant 
I don't know how they meant it. It meant it in, you know, I feel very natural in some way, but it was completely uh, not referring to the presence of organic ingredients anywhere in the product. Um, and if you start flipping Those through... Those are a lot of ingredients. It's a lot of ingredients for shampoo. Uh, just a couple years ago, the U.S. attorney, not the U.S., California's attorney general actually sued a bunch of companies uh, for failing to have a cancer warning label on the product when their shampoos contained 1,4-dioxane. So in Canada, Health Canada says, you know, it's just a trace of 1,4-dioxane. Don't even worry about it. But California's attorney general will sue you if you have it in here and you don't warn people about it. Because you see how different governments react differently to an ingredient. Some say it's safe, others say it's not. Countries, different countries do um, put requirements on different products for perhaps internal reasons as well. So it might be a, a media issue, it might be some other issue um, related to that in that region. Health Canada is a very science-based organization. And anything that we find um, that science justifies it being on the hot list, we add it to the hot list. The hot list is a, pro a tool that we can provide to industry to help them understand which substances are harmful. In California, under their Prop 65 labeling, which is a whole system where uh, basically if a product contains an ingredient, known to the state of California to cause cancer, then it has to have a warning label on the product. Canadian cancer orgs have actually approached Health Canada about bringing in a similar system to California's where we warn consumers when there's a carcinogen in a product. Uh, Health Canada so far has not acted on that, unfortunately. So if we find that a, a product has um, a, a hot list ingredient in it, we have the authority to take action on the product. So action could could range from a seizure so that Health Canada gains control of the product um, to mitigate any risk to, to the public. Um, it could also be a prosecution of the company. And we frequently work with Canada Border Services Agency to make sure that products that are high risk do not get into the country to begin with. So those are some of the things that we can do. Um, in terms of 1,4-dioxane, Health Canada has said that they know that 1,4-dioxane is um, a concern, but they're not worried about it at the trace amounts that are found in uh, shampoo. For an ingredient to get placed on the hot list, um, their scientific review um, about the, regarding the chemical or the ingredient. We also work with our national and international counterparts. We, are, we participate on um, expert panels and when the science is, warrants it, we put it on the hot list if we believe it to be a, a hazard to human health. The 80,000 chemicals that are on the market, only... 80,000! That's right. Only 7% have actually had full toxicological screenings. Of all the chemicals we've allowed on the market, we've just pretty much let them out there without actually having to demonstrate safety before they go to market. Canada is a post-market regime. Its products are not approved prior to sale. Onus is always on industry. We've definitely got a lot further to go in terms of, you know, comparing ourselves to Europe and what they're doing over there, where they have a bit of a different approach. Their new system is to say, okay, you know what? If you want to put out a new chemical, prove it's safe first, and then you can put it on the market. Hey guys, I'm Adria Vassal and this is where I work. Come on in. I'm the author of the Ecoholic book series and I write the weekly Ecoholic column for Now Magazine. Through the you know, post-war 50s kind of chemical boom, we started seeing a different mentality where people were saying, you know, you had the lab coats on TV going, the chemical industry, it's fabulous. And here you go, we've made these wonderful products. And there were no questions asked. In an ideal world, the products that we put on our body, we should be willing to eat. It's not like you're necessarily going to be looking at your shampoo going, oh my God, I'm starving, I want to eat this. My favorite products were the ones where I actually recognized the ingredients as ingredients I could pick up at the grocery store. The problem is that the words natural and organic aren't regulated. So for me, like when I you know, walked into the body shop and they told me, yeah, our stuff is natural, um, I just bought it. It's just frustrating to see the lobbyists that, you know, they're paid to insist that their products are safe, but so, were the tobacco lobbyists. In fact, the New York Times came out last year, I think it was, and called 
endocrine disruptors, the tobacco of our time. And, you know, you're now seeing all these companies say, what's the big deal? Calm down, you know, no, keep smoking. Yeah, everybody raises big tobacco is why we shouldn't believe industry. And I'm not even asking you to believe industry, but you have very good regulators in the European Commission in Europe, the FDA in the United States, certainly in Health Canada, who share information, who work with scientific bodies, who receive this, who do their assessments, and they're the ones who have the final authority on determining if products are safe or not. We're the Canadian Cosmetic uh, Toiletry and Fragrance Association. We're the Industry Association for Personal Care Products in Canada. Now, I hear you have a favorite toothpaste. I have a favorite toothpaste. And you know, because I was being you today, I apologize, it's just a small box, but that's what I had on my uh, my desk at the time. So I want to give you one of your favorite toothpastes. Well, thank you. I, I want to ask you some questions Absolutely. about whether this is going to be bad for me. Oh, it'll be a, it's a good toothpaste, as they all are. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how they're regulated and why they're safe to use and what goes into them. Most toothpastes use uh, as an abrasive uh, minerals. In the case of the toothpaste you've identified, they use a very effective antimicrobial, which um, cleans bacteria, kills bacteria in the mouth, and that's triclosan. I'm trying to understand why some products and some ingredients are banned in different countries, but are still allowed to be um, in ingredients that are used here in Canada. No, that's not quite accurate, actually. Well, I think if you'll find, yeah, Europe has a list of uh, ingredients that they ban or restrict yes. in cosmetic products, um, personal care products, as does Canada and as does the United States. And the lists are set up somewhat differently. But when you look at the products on them, they're all the same result. So you have to compare apples to apples. The European list, for example, lists individual substances in a family or grouping of substances. The Canadian list includes the group. So when you look at the two lists and you say, can you show me an ingredient that is banned in Europe and being used today in products in North America? I put that challenge out several times. And quite frankly, I, no one's ever been able to produce that. Why would the industry choose to use products that are um, questionable at some level? Well, they're not because the safety reviews on those substances have been very lengthy. And These have they found them to be 100% safe at all levels? They have been found, no, they've been found to be safe at the levels they're used. I'll give you an example. Do you drink tap water? Yes. What's in tap water as a preservative? I'm sure all kinds of chemicals. No, 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 chlorine. And we know that in Ontario because of Walkerton. Chlorine is a carcinogen and it's a toxin. It could kill you. But properly used, a certain amount that's sufficient to kill a microbe, but not do harm to humans, is the sweet spot that you want for any preservative. Preservatives, by their nature, are toxins. They're designed to kill microbes. So that's their intent. So the key is to get it, Holly, at the right spot where it's safe for human use, but effective on killing the microbes in the product. So, and we know that in Ontario, because look at the people who died in Walkerton because it wasn't added to their drinking water. The, the beauty of science, the absolute beauty of science, is it knows no boundaries or owners. It belongs to us all. And the world is a very interconnected world. And the science that goes into the, determining the safety of all consumer products, just not cosmetic, has been around a long time. Work is done and brought together by a lot of different people on a lot of different issues all around the world. Some of the environmental uh, action groups, uh, one in the United States, had a very big press conference in Washington a few years ago. And they said to consumers, you shouldn't be using shampoos. They contain 1,4-dioxane, uh, which is a carcinogen. So they said to everyone, don't use, don't use your shampoo. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. Health Canada, not industry, Health Canada looked at the, the numbers the NGOs put out in terms of the presence of 1,4-dioxane. And they said, you would have to wash your hair 620 times a day, every day, to be within any area of concern. I'm not making this up. This is Health Canada's assessment. 
of the data the NGO put out. Now, if that NGO had had a press conference and said, we're here to warn you not to wash your hair 620 times a day, no one would have showed up. People would have laughed. Well, I've heard both sides to the discussion, and I'm probably more confused than ever. It's important to realize that a product that says it's organic may or may not be organic, or it may or may not be natural, and that even though it may say organic and natural, it may not be good. So I thought that Darren was very interesting. He seemed very informed, especially being a former Minister of Health. I found that he, he talked a lot, and I'm not sure he answered all of the questions. Well, I really enjoyed meeting Adria, and she armed me with a lot of good information that really drove me to ask more questions and pay more attention to the ingredients. It's going to be a very long time, I think, before there's a lot of clarity for just the everyday consumer like myself. I feel tired after this process. There's a lot of questions about what may or may not be safe and in what levels. I don't know if some of this is going to be like a tobacco issue, that it just takes years and years before people recognize that things are bad for you, or it may turn out that years and years go by and these things really aren't bad for you. Thank you.